Packed House. This is cool. Um, we're going to talk about Cloud 2.0. Today we're going to touch on some of the things that uh, um, Jim talked about in his keynote, Brandon talked about, Sarah talked about. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be a breakneck pace to get through a pretty complex uh, topic, um, but we'll do our best. Um, my name is Mark Hinkle. I work with Open Source at Citrix. I actually live here in Raleigh. I'm very excited not to be ha in a hotel room traveling on a plane this week. Um, it's really nice to see we have a full house for open source. I travel all over the world for my job, at, going to open source conferences, talking about open source, working with communities, uh, Apache, Linux Foundation. I'm on the board of Zen Project. Um, uh, contrary to, to Jim's comments this morning, it is a pretty good choice for open source uh, virtualization. Uh, Apache Cloud Stack, I work with Open Daylight. Um, a lot of cloud and emerging open source technologies. Um, my slides are downloadable from SlideShare, so I'm going to talk real fast if you want to go back. I usually do a pretty decent job of putting links back into my presentation if you want to go get it later on. So my background is I worked for a company called Cloud.com. Uh, Cloud.com was acquired by Citrix four years ago, January or July. And we made a product called CloudStack. It's now an Apache uh, software project. And so for the last four years, I've been talking about cloud computing, uh, open source cloud computing platforms. Um, and I used to give a lot of cloud talks. And this is what my sort of talk sur sur was uh, centered around back in 2012. You know, cloud computing and Rackspace and Amazon and Microsoft, uh, what it looked like. We had this idea of public and private clouds. And this is sort of my spiel three years ago. That's radically changed. Um, back in those days, people weren't very uh, savvy on the cloud. Um, it was emerging. It doesn't look like it does today. Um, adoption has gone through the roof. Um, and to get an idea, how many people here use infrastructure cloud computing? So something like Amazon EC2, uh, Microsoft of Azure, Google Cloud, um, App Engine, things like that. How many people here use something in their own data center that's cloud-like, like OpenStack? Okay, or VMware vCloud Director, or anybody here use Apache Cloud Stack? You will. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> nah, I'm actually not even going to pitch my stuff today. Um, but what we've talked about in those days was really taking this idea of your data center and moving it to a place where it's, it's managed in the cloud, where it has unlimited elasticity, where it's a utility that you consume on demand, where it has metered self-service, things like that. And sort of the evolution was, uh, and I might have to bring out my glasses to read my speaker's notes, I'm getting old. Um, we talked about back in the 90s, how many people here worked at IBM for 20 years? <laughs> All right. How many people always used to hear about SOA? SOA is the future. SOA is awesome. Service-oriented architecture. These guys are finally vindicated because these guys were talking about these services that were composable to create um, product offerings and you would put them together. Uh, SOA was, a, was, was really something that we talked about in the 95 time frame. Um, we're sort of getting there to, today with uh, uh, microservices. In 2006, we started talking, Amazon launched EC2, and that was sort of the beginning of the real cloud era, where people were consuming what we see as cloud services that were self-service, that had incredible um, uh, resources behind it from compute resources and data centers that are growing every day. 2010 uh, was an interesting year because OpenStack launched um, from NASA with uh, the help of Rackspace. Uh, Apache Cloud Stack was um, launched. Cloud.com was one of the um, high flyers in, that, in 2010. Um, then down the road, we had Docker. How many people here use Docker? Okay, how many people here have heard of Docker? You go to a conference, all you hear is Docker, 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 Docker. It's, you know, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. We'll talk about Docker in a little bit. Um, in 2014, we started hearing more and more about platform as a service and Cloud Foundry. Anybody here use Cloud Foundry? 
Anybody here interested in platform as a service? Okay. Anybody using some other platform as a service other than Cloud Foundry? Okay, cool. <clears throat> Cloud Foundry was something that was developed at EMC slash went to Pivotal, which was a spin out of EMC and now um, lives in the Linux Foundation under the Cloud Foundry um, organization. And finally, this year, uh, there's this thing. How many people here uh, have heard of Kubernetes? So Brandon Phillips today at CoreOS, he's talking about um, Giphy, Google-like infrastructure. Um, Kubernetes is the uh, um, fabric that allows you to run containers across all the Google products and services, and it's really a, um, very interesting compared to what we started with with Amazon in 2006 to what we see in Kubernetes. And they're not apples to apples comparisons, but it's additive, and that additive um, property is something we're going to talk about today is we're entering this area of era of cloud abundance. So when we talked about cloud originally, you had Amazon and it was really, really interesting because now you had developers that could go in with their credit card and very cheaply provision infrastructure that was highly available and elastic and had all these properties that in the past you would have had to invest a lot of money in. That was really interesting. But there were things that were missing. There weren't a lot of tools. There weren't a lot of other uh, management capabilities. There wasn't a variety of services. And now we have all these things are coming of age. Just to give you an idea of how fast they're coming of age, this is a cloud growth chart. You can go Google cloud growth, but the bottom line is that it's a, the uh, growth of cloud services, especially, uh, is over 20% a year. So you see this sort of hockey stick growth. Everybody's interested in cloud, why is, why is it interesting <clears throat> is because it allows us to actually move faster. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, used to give these cloud talks when I was giving that architecture diagram talk and they'd be like, we're moving our CapEx to OpEx. And I'd be like, you know, if you're an accountant, that's interesting. If you're an IT professional, you really don't care. What you care about is being able to address your users' needs faster, being more agile, being um, and that's what's interesting to me about cloud. So to know where we're going, I'm sort, of, um, sort of taking this from where we, are, where we started and why, why we're, we started there and how we're getting to where we're going to be. <clears throat> so we start out with this cloud 1.0 idea, and Amazon was hot. And what happened was everybody had these copycat clouds. They all said, Amazon's awesome. We're going to emulate Amazon. And I think that was, that was a logical first step. I mean, I put our company quote on there at the top is Amazon style clouds, blah, 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 blah. But I don't think that's the point. Early on, we all wanted to create these EC2 copies, but you can't compete with Amazon. They're a huge company. They're the world's leader in logistics. They develop interesting ways to get your product to market quick and delivered fast. That, that, that's Amazon's core competency. And for all these enterprises and all these vendors to try and duplicate that, I think it's sort of a fool's errand. The other thing that people were looking at was Amazon versus Azure versus Google App Engine and now Google Compute Engine. And uh, uh, I stole this sort of um, meme from Adrian Cockcroft. Adrian Cockcroft ran a cloud at Netflix. And he said trying to uh, um, run your stuff on all these clouds was like Roman riding. And that's Roman riding, where you have a foot on each course. Well, when you're trying to develop to Amazon, to Azure, to you know, Rackspace, to all these different clouds, it's tough. It's, um, the tools weren't there. It was really difficult. Amazon or Netflix had, uh, was the poster child for running apps on scale on, on Amazon. And they said, yeah, we, we would love to take advantage of, you know, Google's capacity here, or you know, Rackspace's storage there, but at the end of the day, it was really, really hard. <clears throat> and we used to talk about cloud in this context of public, which is somebody else's data center, Amazon, Azure, Google, private in your data center where you're running it, sort of the open stack deployed on your hardware model, or hybrid, where you had these workloads that just moved from your private cloud to your public cloud and back and forth. People talked about this hybrid cloud model a lot. Personally, I sort of think it's BS. I mean, 
moving a workload and live back and forth is sort of tough all day long, especially at that time. So that's sort of the cloud 1.0. <clears throat> then we had cloud 1.5. This is where I think things are getting really interesting. Um, anybody here read Simon Wardley? He's a um, strategist for uh, CSC. He's a real smart guy. Um, has a British accent, so I think everybody with a British accent smart, sounds smarter. Um, uh, but he's, he he's, uh, talks about strategy. He used to run cloud uh, at Ubuntu, at Canonical. And he sort of describes the enterprise adoption of cloud. So everybody else, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Googles, they're figuring out cloud pretty qu quickly. The enterprise that he deals with in his daily job you know, they're like, this, this is really cool, this looks interesting. They weren't doing, doing anything, they weren't doing anything, and then about 2010, 2011, they're like, hey, we have to have a cloud strategy, and we have to have it yesterday. So um, <clears throat> that's sort of where we were in cloud 1.5. Amazon's legitimate, Google has a legitimate offering, Microsoft is getting to the point where they're gonna they were gonna have a really, really strong cloud offering, and people in an enterprise IT situation were gonna be in a position to capitalize on it. And by the way, I think one of the ones that, I'm an open source guy and I really like Google and Amazon because they're built on open source software, but for application space, I really think Microsoft Azure is getting more open source friendly and is a really competitive platform as sort of the, the laggard in that space, in my opinion. So, all of a sudden, everybody is rushing to get a cloud adoption. The other thing that's happening at the same time is there's an abundance of cloud tools coming up. And so, how many people here use configuration management from Puppet or Chef? Okay. How many people here use uh, uh, automation through Ansible or SaltStack? So, which is really interesting. Sometimes people intermingle them because you can do configuration management with Chef, with uh, SaltStack and Ansible, but all of a sudden you have all these tools and the lines are blurred on how you do this, but you can manage large amounts of infrastructure through automation with all these tools. Um, we also see things that are coming from, anybody use the HashiCorp tools, Vagrant, Vault, uh, Packer? You start seeing things like these where they're Packer allows you to package images across different infrastructures. Remember the rim and writing problem? Um, from different clouds, you have Packer that can actually package images for different uh, virtualization targets. You have Vault that manages secrets across different infrastructure. You've got Red Hat. Um, I put this in because we're sitting in the shadow of Red Hat. Red Hat Manage IQ is, is the uh, Red Hat open source virtualization cloud management platform. And obviously Docker. Here's a great story about Docker. You know how Docker, what Docker was originally not a company called Docker, it was called um, Dot Cloud, and they were offered platform as a service. Their platform, and they were a partner of mine, and they you know, had a reasonable, respectable offering. The thing that was interesting about Docker was, Docker was developed for the guys to manage their paths, Dot Cloud. And if you guys, um, <clears throat> Over, anybody here use Opsware? Okay, probably. Opsware is Mark Andreessen's company that used to be LoudCloud. LoudCloud was one of the first probably managed cloud offerings. What happened was their cloud offering wasn't great, but their tool was awesome. And the reason their tool was awesome, it was informed by their experience. And this is of all the reasons why I like open source, is when you have a problem to solve, you make better product. I work for a vendor. And it's tough for me to make product because I don't feel the pain that you as users feel every day. So I have to ask you and you have to tell me and then I bungle it and try and implement what you want and then you tell me I'm wrong and we do that back and forth. The thing that's interesting about Docker was these guys had a pain point, they developed a tool, the tool became awesome and now everybody here is going Docker, 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 Docker. And they sold off their paths and I don't think, and Docker.com doesn't, or Docker Inc. no longer manages that pause. So we had an abundance of tools. The next thing is we had a change in culture. How many people here know what DevOps is? Okay. <clears throat> so there's a couple things. Do you guys know who the guy in the middle is? 
The guy in the middle is Patrick Dubois. He's the godfather. He's the guy who coined the term DevOps. He's the guy who runs DevOps Days. And he is a system administrator. He's a real humble guy. He lives in the countryside outside of Brussels. Um, but he said, you know, I talk about tech all the time, but it's not just about tech. It's actually about the culture around tech. And that's part of what needs to be talked about. So we started the DevOps movement. <coughs> Tools, culture, um, they, I think there's an acronym, CLAMS, which is cool, culture, automation, uh, and I'm, it's early in the morning and I can't remember the other two. But Google CAMS and John M. Willis and Damon Edwards, they're two of the thought leaders there. They talked about how culture and automation and tools all come together and are needed for DevOps. Sharing is the S in CAMS. You also, anybody here read The Phoenix Project? Phoenix Project is a book about DevOps written by Gene Kim. Gene Kim was the original author of Tripwire, the, the security system. Um, sort of a, a tale of how DevOps can affect companies every day. And then you got places like Netflix open source program where they actually talk about or actually implement DevOps and share that back with the community. If you're ever in California, they have a, a DevOps or they have an open source meetup for Netflix. It's just fascinating because they talk about all this stuff that we talk about in our daily lives around DevOps and the tools, but they're doing it at a massive, massive, massive scale. Um, they're walking the walk. So this is sort of, we're in this 1.5 area era where you know you have tools becoming abundant, you have culture that's no longer, we have developers and we have operations, we have developers that talk to the operations and we don't operate in our silos. It's, you know, this, this thought, this change in the way we, we work is starting to come about. And really, it's, we have a long way to go as an industry, but it's better than it was. So this is how I think 1.5 the cloud industry shakes out. You've got these public cloud vendors, so you've got Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. They're really the public cloud. And what they offer is a global footprint, they have massive scale, they have a stream <clears throat> velocity you can move at. Um, that's where they're strong. Uh, stability, security, and privacy, those things, they're, they're not bad, but that's not their forte. Um, you also have this managed cloud, and that's what I think the differentiation is, is there's only three that I would consider really truly public clouds, even though you have other cloud providers. That, that, that utility computing that has unlimited bandwidth and all those global footprint and things, those three are the leaders. Then you have this cloud public cloud that I say is managed, but they have additional things. So you have things like Verizon Terramark and Orange and CenturyLink that not only offer cloud computing services, but they offer um, <clears throat> the end-to-end -end link. They offer the pipes to get to their cloud. Because right now, you go to an Amazon data center, you still have your bandwidth provider that provides that. It's not Amazon. Someday it may be Google, but uh, um, I think that's a differentiation between the two. Um, they also usually offer you know, higher, higher level services, security and SLAs that are different than, and more fine-grained than an Amazon or a, a Google or a, a Microsoft. Then you have this, this sort of third level that I call the service provider cloud, which is, not, is sort of that managed cloud, but they also have a component where they have services that, you know, they have IBM global services that can help you with IBM software. You have HP that has a whole suite of hardware and software that can go with that. So those three areas are where I think we shake out. That's, that's, that's sort of, you know, they're not necessarily just trying to emulate Amazon, but they have Amazon with different services layered on it, different qualities of service, higher bandwidth, higher um, um, storage, SLAs, things like that, or different. I shouldn't say necessarily higher. Then the next big thing that happened was containers. And containers aren't, an old, aren't a new idea. Containers are actually pretty, you know, they've been around for a while. The idea of a container existed on Solaris. Um, there's a company called Joyent who uh, uh, uses the uh, Illuminos kernel from Solaris that's open source. They've implemented this. The thing that's interesting is the Docker folks have created this container that has really caught on and has become widely adopted um, because it runs on Linux. It was one of the early 
leverage points as they used it instead of the, uh, the container runtime run was LXC, was Linux containers. So um, <clears throat> Docker is the one we know. There's also Rocket from Core S. But at the end of the day, it's a uh, lightweight Linux execution environment for the application layer. Um, <clears throat> gives you a unit of uh, isolation that's also portable across different clouds. It doesn't rely, rely on the uh, um, hardware, so it should be independent. Um, <clears throat> Multi-tenancy, heavyweight, and it's not as heavy as VM. So it's taking the, the VM, which is the emulated operating, uh, hardware running an operating system, now it's going down to the application layer. And given the fanfare around it, you would think it's like a flux capacitor. I mean, it makes cloud computing possible today. Everybody loves containers, and the reason they love containers is it's easy. Uh, two years ago, I went to OzCon, uh, the open source conference in Portland. Uh, Docker ran a uh, um, two-hour training session on Docker. Uh, James Turnbull, who's now at uh, Kickstarter, runs their infrastructure, gave this, this talk. And in two hours, they had 500 people running Docker. That's pretty amazing that we were you know, starting applications, distributed applications. Um, the command line is easy to integrate into your operating system, whether it's Linux or Windows or uh, Mac OS. Um, it's re the code's reusable. I create an application, and I want to give it to a colleague to use. They can add, add on um, their, their stuff through sort of a, a uh, compos composable layers. Um, the repo you can create repos and share your code, share your applications easily. All these things make Docker interesting. Um, because it's easy and it allows collaboration. There's a lot of criticism for it. Uh, uh, on the other hand, that there's security prop. There's a really good article, and I forget who wrote it. Not that I know if it's right or wrong, but it was thought provoking of whether or not containers are secure or not, and the fact that we have stuff moving around all the time, and we're sharing our code, and whether our keys get in there, and things like that. I think it's interesting to think about. Um, but for right now, I think containers are the way we'll deploy applications. And not just, um, right now, it's very much a Linux application thing. Microsoft is actually supporting containers on Azure, and we'll see them supporting Windows applications and containers at some point in the future. Oops. So this is where I think we ended up um, with open cloud infrastructure and cloud 1.5. So we had this. This compute layer, this is the traditional virtualization that's VMware, it's KVM, it's Zen, it's uh, <clears throat> VMware, and we have containers now. We have um, access to distributed storage. How many people here use Ceph or Gluster? Okay. Interesting open source storage projects from Red, that Red Hat bought a company called Ink Tank that did Ceph, they bought Gluster. There's, uh, Interesting commodity storage. Um, how many people here work for a NetApp or EMC? You guys should check it out. Um, just saying, it's, it's an interesting way to know what your competitors are doing. You also have the, the other issue in 1.5 that came to light is the fact that everything is programmable infrastructure. You can start and stop instances on Amazon. You can, you can provision uh, storage on the fly. You can do all these things dynamically. The choke point was networking. So they, the leaders in the networking space, Cisco, Microsoft, IBM, VMware, Citrix, uh, Brocade, Juniper, all got together and said, hey, we're going to work on uh, software-defined networking controller. It allows me to program my network so it can be as agile as the rest of my infrastructure. And that Project Daylight was was born. There's other open source um, SDN projects out there now, but that's probably the biggest standpoint. When I said earlier it wasn't about CapEx to OpEx, um, the thing was ag agility. The one place that we're not agile in the cloud is networking compared to the rest of everything that we do there. So let's talk about Cloud 2.0. That's where we are today. It's where awesome happens. So. Um, I use this slide probably in every open source talk I ever give since for the last two years, and I've probably given hundreds of them. Um, I like this, this quote from Alison Randall. This is what's interesting about open source, and this is why cloud can happen. 
is the fact is technical innovation is not stealing from each other. It's not competitive like it is in the proprietary world. And I work in a proprietary company. We have a lot of proprietary software. I work on the open source side because I think it's interesting that we aren't competing for resources <coughs> but creating new ones together. There's a lot of things that I do in my job that allow us to not have to duplicate effort. Like Linux is a great example. The reason Linux is cool is because HP and IBM and Red Hat and SUSE, who are all competitors, can all share the burden of creating a Linux kernel. A Linux kernel and scheduler is not a differentiating technology. For them to have their engineers duplicate that, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't add any incremental value. By collaborating on that, they can do things like ad management and other th application level things that do add value to the Linux op operating system. So open source isn't a zero sum game. The other thing about open source is I think you got to think of it from this standpoint. I work in an open source office at Citrix. We're approximately $4 billion in revenue. I give away probably software that could be valued at many hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Not always the most popular guy with the accountants. However, what you have to understand is, and the point I just made was, that when it comes to open source and you're in for, whether you're a vendor or you're at a company, you really should work on innovating <coughs> for things that don't exist. Leverage what does exist. So there's something out there that could be good enough. Rather than recreating the wheel, if it doesn't work exactly the way you need, submit a patch, submit a bug report, help make that better, and then commoditize the stuff that's non-differentiating. So I told you about the Linux kernel. The Linux um, operating system vendors have done a really good job of making the kernel a commodity. It's used across those server operating systems, it's used in Android, it's used in embedded Linux like Intel talked about today. That's a good, a good way to, innov to commoditize it. Because you know, at the end of the day, that doesn't add any value to the end user as long as you have something stable in it. <clears throat> Here's the, the thing that's changed in Cloud 2.0. You know how I had my silos early on and I said we had public cloud, we had private cloud, we had hybrid cloud? I don't think that's accurate anymore. I think we have cloud, and I think that cloud is a fabric made out of stuff. And that stuff are components. So componentization, um, <clears throat> we're, just like in software, we have libraries. In the cloud, we have, we have components that are services. We're composing those services into offering public-facing products. I think Amazon does a great job of it. Even though it's one vendor, they've taken all these little services and allow you to put, you know, no SQL data tables in there with storage and with you know, compute. And, and they've, they've created it so that, that you can compose all their different services into some kind of offering, whether it's Netflix offering movies or some other you know, Web 2.0 company offering a service, or what's happening now is more big companies that are saying, hey, I should be doing the same things that Twitter and Facebook and Google are, that Giphy that um, uh, <clears throat> Brandon was talking about today. Funny thing is, this isn't a really a new idea. Um, <clears throat> this is also the definition of componentization. This, this comes from the SOA definition back in 1995. The thing is, in 1995, we weren't in that cloud area of abundance to have all these components from different places that we can combine. We didn't have all these open source tools and open source software to combine to offer a product. <clears throat> now, I think Sarah uh, Novotny is giving a talk on microservices this afternoon. I think microservices is a really interesting area. And the idea with microservices is that you're offering a cloud service that does one thing, that does thing, one thing very well, and you can mix those things together to offer some kind of offering. It may be, if you're a shipper, you may have a microservice that does um, postal lookups. And if you're, you may have a mic microservice that does credit card adjudication. You may have all these things that allow people to go in and print their shipping online. They, they utilize microservices. We're going to see more and more people that are no longer going to try and put all their services within their own data center and compose them. You may have services running on um, Amazon. You may have you know, a service that's using Amazon Lambda. You may have 
virtual machines running on Google Compute Engine, and you may have a data source within your data center, you're going to compose them to offer the most awesome app we've ever seen. I don't know what that is, but please give me some founder stock. Um, the only problem with that, and this is, a, this is the 2015 warning, is all of a sudden you're going to have service pr proliferation. So you're going to have stuff all over the place. It's going to look cool. The biggest thing we have to worry about then is when we have all this cool stuff that we're going to combine, um, whether or not um, <clears throat> we're going to worry, of, we're going to have it coming together. This is a quote from uh, Mitchell Hashimoto, who is the founder of HashiCorp, and he thinks that that is going to be a problem for 2015. I tend to agree, because it creates what I call the zombie problem. Anybody watch The Walking Dead? What's the worst thing you can do when the zombies are chasing you is go into a house that has a lot of windows. Because they're standing there with the door and then all the zombies come in the windows. And service if you have all these services, you gotta have to make sure that you're boarding up all the windows. So that's, that's what I call the zombie problem. So this is what Cloud 2.0 looks like to me. We have public cloud, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Azure. Those are the three. Those are the standard utility computing. It's the same as whether you have, you know, electricity from a vendor, whether it's your local Con Ed or whoever it is, you have, you have this utility standard computing and the differentiation between the three are going to be minimal, in my opinion. Massive footprints, secure, they're going to have competitive pricing, they're going to be portable across each place, um, they're going to allow you to do distributed applications and they're going to offer microservices as Amazon's starting to do already. Then you're going to have this private cloud. I call this the minimum viable cloud. So earlier I said Amazon's the leader, Google's the leader. We, we just use the, the term in the keynote, Giphy, because that's the way they do, do it, and they do it better than everybody else. We want to do it like them, but it's unrealistic for a company with 500 people to go and duplicate what Google does with hundreds of thousands of people that specialize in IT. So we'll probably see in our own data center the minimum viable cloud which will do the have rapid elasticity. We'll be able to meter and attribute these applications to different business units. But we're not going to have that proliferation of microservices like Amazon does at scale. Um, we're going we're to host it on our hardware, which is fine because then we can control how it performs. We can, we can administer it. We can offer service levels that meet our needs internally. Um, we're probably not going to have as many zones as a public cloud. so. If you're an international corporation and you want to have 30 zones like Amazon will have, that's going to be expensive. They, you know, that's, that's the differentiation. You might have five. You may have one in each you know, major geo, geolocation in the world. <clears throat> but uh, it's not just going to be public and private either. We're probably going to see federation. So we're going to have public clouds and private clouds. It's going to be part of the cloud fabric. I hope we stop saying hybrid cloud because I just don't like it. I don't think it connotes what we were, we're trying to accomplish. And then we have this public cloud plus. And the public cloud plus has a greater de um, degree of specialization. I think a great public cloud we don't talk about is Salesforce's cloud, which was Heroku, which was the original platform as a service. They have a ton of uh, ability to write applications for Salesforce. That's a highly specialized cloud. Um, I think HP is going to offer things like that. I think IBM will offer things like that with their Blue Mix. Um, Blue Mix is their uh, platform as a service uh, on top of their Watson offerings. You have Verizon that will do things like that will provide better levels of service because they own the pipes. You'll have you know, HP who has a security division or, or partner with security division to offer you security services. They'll offer you continuous integration and build services, which are things that the big three public cloud providers may provide, but I think they can specialize on it. Um, that's where I think we're going to shake out. <clears throat> so I've been railing on this idea of hybrid cloud not being a good thing. I think we're going to have one cloud, and I think it's going to have many pieces. So we're going to have Microsoft working with it, Red Hat's open shift. We'll have Cloud Foundry running in our data centers work working with applications running on Google Cloud. We'll have microservices all over the place, and they'll all be woven together in a fabric. And not every user is going to use all these things, 
But when you stop thinking about it of, is it my cloud or their cloud, or is it a single cloud, you have a better design pattern to think about things holistically rather than in these silos, and I think we'll go a lot farther. So that is all I have. Um, I think I hit us pretty much right on the time. Um, I'm easy to find. You can Google me. That type's pretty small, but Mark Hinkle. I'm MR Hinkle on Twitter. Socialized Software is my blog. Um, I live here in Raleigh, and I think it would be awesome to meet more people locally that are interested in cloud and open source. So I would love to meet more people so I don't have to get on the plane, and I can justify my existence to my um, employers. We have a big, big office down the street here that I don't go into, but if I had a reason to meet people, it would be great. So uh, um, look me up. Any, I can answer one or two questions probably, and then it's break time. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>